So let's answer the question whether social interactions can be rewarding. And we'll be looking into a number of studies that have basically shown this correlation. So the neural correlate within the reward system um, while participants are performing some kind of social choice task. Um, this gives us sort of indirect evidence, which is based on a reverse inference. So we have to be careful here, but it's uh, the, the evidence that we're gonna discuss is consistent with the hypothesis that under certain circumstances, social interactions within these kinds of games can be rewarding. Before we delve into some of these experiments, let me give you a quick note on methods in social neuroscience or social neuroeconomics in this case. So what I'm showing you here are two different types of games, a social game and a control game that does not involve any social interactions. And this is how these types of experiments are typically conducted. So to identify specifically social type of decisions and the neural correlates thereof, um, we typically want to include a game that involves an interaction uh, that involves the same decisions, that has the same visual uh, type of setup as the, uh, as the social game. So we want to have a control game that matches perfectly the social game that we're interested in. And then by contrasting the social task or the social game to the control game, we can identify those regions that are specifically activated during the time points of social decision-making relative to non-social decision-making. And this is what this is showing here, where we have a very well-matched uh, risk game or investment game that matches the um, trust game of interest but similar types of, of control games can be used uh, where participants typically interact with some kind of computer algorithm or are told that they're interacting with a computer and not a human being. So that is the only difference between these two games, uh, such that the returns in one game depend on the decisions of another person, whereas the decisions in the other game, the control game, depend on uh, the outcome of some algorithm, some chance, basically. Let's have a look at one of the first studies that I wanted to show you here. This is a, a paper by um, Rilling et al. that looked at cooperation in the prisoner's dilemma game. And one of the surprising results here that also supports uh, some of the behavioral uh, outcomes that we discussed earlier are that there is an increased activation during mutual cooperation trials but not during trials that lead to the largest outcomes, namely when player A, so the person in the scanner, defected, and player B, the person outside the scanner, cooperated. What we see here is that there's increased act activation in the OFC and the ventral striatum. And we might call this region the ventral medial prefrontal cortex as well. So this is basically indicating that these regions show increased responses uh, during mutual cooperation rather than during the outcome that actually leads to larger monetary payoffs for the person in the scanner, indicating that uh, mutual cooperation might have some, um, well, additional benefits or some additional utility that is observed by these, by these players. In this PET study, the authors looked at uh, trust games with punishment options and the neural correlates when player A received the amount that was uh, back transferred by player B. So just as a reminder in the trust game, we have two players that interact with each other. Uh, player A sends an initial amount from his endowment to player B. This could be, let's say, 10 euros. Uh, player B then receives this amount, which is usually tripled. So the player B would hold 30 euros in this case. And then player B makes a decision of how much to back transfer to player A. Um, this could be anything out of those 30 euros that player B holds at this moment. So it could be 15 euros, which would be a fair amount to back transfer, but it could also be as little as zero euros, uh, in which case player A would walk away with nothing. Now, in this game here, player A has a, the option to punish. That means when player A receives an amount that he or she finds unfair, she can then go ahead and punish player B. And punishment was implement, implemented in these four different conditions. Um, intentional refers to the back transfer of player B being actually intentional by the player. So that means uh, the player has the option, the decided player B decided how much to back transfer. Uh, Non-intentional refers to the fact that 
a random algorithm then decided the back transfer amount and player B did not. Right, so this is a control condition here that I mentioned earlier. Uh, costly means that player A has an additional budget that he has to draw from to, um, to basically invest into taking away money from the other player. Typically, this is um, investing one monetary unit subtracts two monetary units from player B. So let's say you're player A, you just trusted player B, but then you got back nothing. You would then want to punish player B. And so you might invest um, 10 monetary units to subtract 20 monetary units from player B. This way, at least he hurts a little bit and, and uh, gets some, some sort of feedback for his unfair behavior. There's also the intentional free condition where player B's spec transfer was intentionally uh, conducted and player A's punishment is free. So any, any amount could be invested and that's what's shown here, right? So actual payoff reduction imposed on B means how much of the payoff uh, was actually subtracted. So if this is free uh, relative to when it's uh, costly, players uh, player A's invest a lot more to punish player B. Then intentional symbolic means that while the um, back transfer of the player B was intentional, the punishment actually does not do anything to player B. So you're just indicating that you're unhappy and punishing is, in this case, symbolic. It's just an expression, but nothing actually gets subtracted uh, from player B's account. So you're basically saying, this is how much I would have invested uh, had I been able to do anything about this. You can see that not much money is invested here. And when obviously the back transfer is non-intentional, there should also be not much money invested there. The interesting thing is that this PET scan, so this is not fMRI, this is PET, uh, which was taken during this moment of receiving the back transfer and making a decision about how much to punish, um, showed an activation in ventral striatum, but only when the um, uh, back transfer was intentional, so when it was actually made by player B, and when punishment could actually do something to the participants, so when they actually did reduce the amount of player B's account, as shown in this figure here. You can also see that there's a perceived unfairness level here um, in these different conditions for this unfair, um, for these unfair type trials, right? Um, so this activation here shows that in the uh, treatment conditions relative to the two control conditions, we see an increased signal in this in this region. So uh, this is an increased PET signal, which is uh, related to, um, again, cerebral blood flow. And in the, implicating this, uh, this ventral striatum region then in um, punishment. You can also see that at a relation, at the, there's a relationship between the amount that was invested for punishing, so this expression of anger in a sense, uh, at, at the monetary level, and the response magnitude in this region, showing basically that people that are angry um, show a larger response in, in this region. Now, you could interpret this result, given that this is in the reward system, um, as indicating again that. Um, it may be rewarding to punish other people. Uh, it might be an expression of anger that uh, that uh, that has some rewards uh, associated with it, in a sense. But obviously, this would be a reverse inference. Um, but that being said, there is additional uh, evidence for this coming from this um, Singer et al. paper from 2006, which was conducted after the previous study that I showed you. And here we have a similar setup. We again have a trust game, but then we have two players that people interact with. We have a, a second mover that is actually a confederate of the, um, of the researchers here, and a first mover who is the person scanned in the, in the scanner. Now, the first thing to note is that these trust games were played before the people went into the scanner. So they got to know a fair player and they got to know an unfair player. And then while participants were in the scanner, they observed this, this fair player and the unfair player in pain. So this is one of these uh, famous empathy studies. So I'll explain this in a second. The important thing is that this is an induction to con consider one as fair and the other one as unfair. And you can see here that, that this is also reflected in the ratings. Uh, so fair players 
are the ones at the top here and unfair players are the ones at the bottom here so their unfair players are not liked they're not thought of as attractive fair or pleasant whereas fair players are uh, thought of relatively highly right so those are just uh, manipulation checks that this did this game where you interact in a trust game with an unfair or no, versus a fair play also induce these types of perceptions and then there was this interesting result um, in males only but let me explain the study really quickly so what what typically happens in these studies is you you put a person in the scanner uh, and then let's say in this case you would have the fair player sitting on the left and the unfair player sitting on the right and then you attach the hands of the of all of these people that are in the scanner room so the person in the scanner the participant in this case the unfair and the fair player um, to to electrodes that send electric shocks to the hand and there's a computer screen uh, that the person in the scanner looks at that basically has a downward pointing arrow when he or she receives uh, a, an electric shock that is mildly painful herself or when the fair or the unfair player receive electric shocks so they know at any time point in this experiment who is receiving electric shocks um, and possibly how intense these electric shocks are because they also experience these shocks themselves. Um, typically, this is a setup that's used for, for empathy um, because we see sort of the neural correlates related to empathy when we see a loved person that, that, is, being, that is receiving electrical shocks and is in pain at these moments. But here we're looking at something else. We're actually looking at the activation um, in the nucleus accumbens when an unfair trust game player is receiving uh, these painful electrical stimuli to the hand. Um, and the researchers were actually surprised that they find this kind of activation in the nucleus accumbens. They find it only for men, but not for women. Basically implicating the nucleus accumbens, uh, which is part of the... Uh, reward security or the valuation system uh, in observing someone in pain that has done harm to you at an earlier stage, right? Um, again, this occurred only in, in, in men. Another interesting correlation here is that men's desire for revenge actually correlated um, with the nucleus accumbens activation during the time point that they saw the other person, this unfair trust game player in pain. This is again a suggestion that the ventral striatum <clears throat> might be involved in um, perceptions or in the emotional reactions to seeing other people that have been unfair to you being punished and sort of a neural call it of, of schadenfreude, if you will. So the happiness that you perceive of someone that is uh, not very liked by you is in pain. Again, this is based on reverse inference, but we can see now that there's sort of a pattern emerging, right? Um, based on a number of studies that have shown this. As a final study that implicates uh, striatum activity in, um, well, social decision-making, let's consider this study on charitable donations. In this experiment, subjects either received a certain amount to themselves, uh, which is shown in the upper right-hand corner. So in these cases, um, these are the payoffs for the subjects or the costs for the subjects, or they got to invest into um, a local food bank, which is uh, uh, obviously a charity that uh, subjects were familiar with. And that's what's shown in the bottom right-hand corners of these matrices. So top left-hand corner is payout or cost to subject. Um, bottom right-hand corner is uh, donation to charity. And so they went through all these different types of um, of trials where some there was some cost to invest into a charity. Obviously, the best types of trials are uh, those where there's no cost, but something is given to charities anyway. Um, and the question then was, how how many times would participants accept this transfer? And you can see that if there's no cost involved to the subject, so loss to subject is here. Again, that's what's plotted here in the upper left-hand corner. Then participants would obviously go ahead and give the amounts uh, to charity and accept this, this transfer when there's a positive amount that goes to the charity, not so much when there's a zero amount that goes to the charity. And as the cost increased to the subject, um, the uh, likelihood of accepting the charity would go down. So this makes perfect sense, right? And this is a rating of subject satisfaction. Obviously, when subjects receive money, 
uh, that that gives satisfaction, but also when subjects are able to donate to charities, which is shown here in the green, uh, at no cost to themselves. But when there's a low cost, uh, they also like those types of um, transfers to the charity uh, that that give high outcomes to the charity. So this this is a subject giving up 15 euros and transferring 45 euros, or in this case, actually US dollars, to the charity. This is something that's very liked by participants. So it makes a lot of sense in terms of the behavioral data. Let's have a look at what plays out at the neural data. And what we're seeing here is in the yellow, these are transfers to the subject. So those are the um, uh, time points when subjects receive uh, a transfer to themselves, which are these types of trials here. And we can see in the yellow that uh, activity in the ventral striatum correlated with how much money was transferred to the subject. But at the same time, also when participants chose to donate to charity, we see that the ventral striatum shows activity that tracks how much money goes to the charity. So this is sort of indicating here that um, giving to other people also seems to involve the reward system. And in this paper, it was taken as an indication that participants perceive some kind of warm glow or feel some kind of reward from giving to others. Again, this is somewhat of a, of a reverse inference here. But what we've seen in any case across all these different studies that we've discussed now is that there's something rewarding uh, related to social outcomes in, or at least that they're processed in the brain's reward system or as we've come to know in this part of the of the brain the valuation system uh, specifically in the nucleus accumbens and the ventral striatum and we can even look at a meta-analysis which is shown here these are activations to monetary rewards which is something you can look at uh, look up at neurosense if you type in reward uh, you find that the ventral striatum is commonly activated during these uh, types of uh, experiences. Now, a nice paper by uh, Fair um, has looked at the overlap between monetary reward and social rewards. And uh, you can see already here, this is sort of qualitative evidence. These are the different activation um, regions within the striatum that monetary rewards consistently activates uh, ventral striatum. Obviously, that's also um, indicated here via this meta-analysis. Uh, the same is obviously also true for social reward with a bit more distribution here, uh, but you can see that uh, social reward also does activate the ventral striatum. So there seems to be some kind of overlap in how we process monetary versus social rewards. But uh, to really um, show this, we have to conduct a study uh, that does both of these things, that independently varies monetary rewards as well as social rewards. And this was done by Izuma et al. in 2008, um, basically to try and show that monetary rewards and social rewards are processed in the same regions of the brain um, and therefore seem to reflect the same underlying um, neural mechanisms in both non-social and social contexts. And so what they did here is they had a monetary reward task and a social reward task that was performed in the same subjects. The monetary reward task was performed in week one and it was simply selecting one of the cards and then finding out what kind of amount was under the, uh, under the card that was selected. And there could be a, a low monetary reward, which was between 19 and 210 yen, or a high monetary reward, which was between 270 and 319 yen. And then you can look at the neural correlates to the outcome that is shown here. All right, so when it's low, you would expect lower ventral striatal activity. When it's higher, you would expect higher ventral strit uh, striatal activity. Uh, they had this very interesting social reward task that was followed by it. Let's say there was a week between the first task and the second task. Um, but Immediately after this task was done, the subjects were asked to uh, fill out a questionnaire about their personality and record a short video in which they talk about themselves. And then, so were the subjects told, uh, another set of participants would look at the uh, videos and their questionnaires and the answers on their questionnaires and then give a rating um, about the participants, which they would then receive in the scanner during the next session. So the ratings could be, for instance, 
I find you trustworthy, right? Or I find you modest, or the rating could be withheld. So we have then similar or parallel to the monetary reward task, we have a social reward task where another participant that um, saw you uh, and saw your video and your questionnaires then gives you a rating uh, that could either be a high social reward or a low social reward. So words like trustworthy would be considered high social reward. Words like modest would be considered low social rewards. And this could be given to either about the self, so specifically a rating about you, or a rating about another person that also participated in this experiment. So let's have a look at what the neural correlates of this look like. Uh, you can see that monetary and social reward overlap here. So this is showing the overlap of these two uh, activations for the monetary and the social reward. Um, and, and in the ventral striatum, we see the following patterns. So the caudate nucleus, which is this region here, the gray part here, we see for the monetary reward task, a larger responses during high monetary relative to low monetary rewards relative to no. So there's a linear increase here, maybe a bit nonlinear. And for the social reward, when it's about yourself, or so the, so the participant in the scanner, so when they get a rating of trustworthy, this same region showed a high response. When it's only modest, which is positive, but not that great, then it's a somewhat lower response. Uh, again, you can see that this nicely follows uh, the type of rewards in the in a monetary do domain um, when they are also occurring in the social domain. The same occurs in other regions. We see this linear trend here uh, as the type of uh, as the magnitude of the reward increases, so does the bolt uh, activity in these regions. But it doesn't matter whether it's a monetary or a social reward as long as it concerns the self. So what this showing us is that indeed, uh, there is overlap uh, even within the same subjects uh, implicating the reward system in both monetary but also social rewards. And as you might remember, um, this is highly reminiscent of what we've discussed in an earlier video, namely that there seems to be a common currency in the brain such that different types of rewards are translated to the same type of currency so that we can make these abstract decisions about, let's say, social types of rewards versus uh, some other type of reward. Should I spend time with a friend or should I watch Netflix by myself? Something like that. So these kinds of choices that involve different uh, choice domains uh, can be made by translating the value of a certain action or the value of a choice option into a common currency within the brain. And there's now a lot of evidence that this common currency in the brain is processed within this uh, valuation system that's shown here, right? The ventral medial prefrontal cortex and clearly the ventral striatum, which has been shown by this Izuma study. So we want to add social choice to the types of different decisions, simple choice, intertemporal choice, risky choice, um, um, ambiguity even to, to some extent um, that are processed in this very same uh, uh, network. And this is exactly what's been discussed by Fair and Ruff in a review article in 2014, um, namely that social and non-social rewards seem to be processed in the in the same system, but that the that the system receives input from regions that are specifically processing social uh, context versus other regions that might be processing specifically non-social context, whereas where the circuit here is the neural circuit that involves the evaluation regions that we've seen now um, processing these types of stimuli, these types of outcomes of our decisions, namely um, VMPFC, ventral striatum, and other areas. Um, and it's not the case, so the authors argue, that there's a specific system that does only social rewards and another specific system that processes only non-social rewards. In fact, this would be an inefficient way of coding, right? It is much more efficient to have a system that processes all rewards and translate these into a common currency and therefore enables these types of decisions um, that may compare social versus risky choice or um, the, make, make these types of ab abstract types of decisions that we make on a daily basis possible. So there's quite some evidence for this extended common currency schema 
that involves higher cognitive areas at sort of a, a, a higher level, um, and then the valuation system at a lower level.